Great, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I would like to uh, say that this, this is uh, a, a, the, the work that I'm presenting is by, uh, by Trish Clay, a postdoc in Manchester, working on the, on the Noble project. And I'd like to acknowledge my, my co-authors, Trish's co-authors, Ray Burgess, Hannah Busman, Lorraine Rudzi, Bastian Jochman, uh, James Day, and uh, I'm, I'm Chris Ballantyne giving, giving the presentation. So, uh, completely opposite. We're going from, from iron cores to the, to, to, the, to the other end of the spectrum. Where, where, where do the volatiles come from? Um, we all want to, and we all realize how important volatiles are for controlling planetary processes. And simple questions, how did the Earth obtain its volatile content? Where were the sources? How has it evolved both during the accretionary process and over the lifetime of the planet? Fundamental questions to understanding the way planets evolve and why planets can be, uh, support life. We know the volatile elements influence the physical and chemical properties of the planetary bodies. We know they control melt properties, volcanism, degassing, climate and atmosphere. We've seen much focus on understanding the origin of volatiles from, you'll have seen, seen the deuterium-hydrogen um, de debate about cometary versus non-cometary sources of water. You'll have seen uh, arguments based on noble gas compositions uh, about the particular source of volatiles in planetary bodies. But what I want to talk today about are the halogens and how we can use halogens to gain information about the processes that might be occurring that might particularly affect the volatiles in planetary accretionary processes. The halogens are particularly interesting and particularly useful because they've got a wide range of chemical volatility. So we're going from chlorine right the way through to bromine and iodine. I'm not talking about fluorine um, today. I'm just talking about uh, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. But they've got a large range of volatility uh, from, from uh, moderate to, to fairly highly volatile. They're all large ionic radii, which means they're incredibly incompatible. But they're also very reactive, so completely opposite to something like the noble gases. These guys, these guys do react, but because they're volatile, because they're incompatible, provide a proxy for some of those volatile processes that, that, are, that are going on. They're also fluid mobile. Um, so they are actually responsive to a wide range of processes that you might expect to fractionate the chlorine from the bromine from the iodine. But the question is, how good a data set can we, can we get uh, to uh, test those processes and test those, the, 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 uh, the, the way the halogens might be responding to those early processes. So, uh, uh, along with everybody, we need to start somewhere. We start with the carbonaceous chondrites. We want to know what and how well we know the carbonaceous chondrite, uh, the primitive, undifferentiated material that we start with. We need to characterize that and look at the current data set. And then from that, we can compare that to the bulk silicate earth and start identifying maybe the processes that could be occurring in the accretion from the carbonaceous chondrite through to the planetary bodies. So I've told you why we want to look at uh, the, 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 the halogens in particular and chondrites and halogens, but this is a plot uh, just losing it on the edge. Uh, so the, this is the bulk silicate earth uh, normalized to the... Uh, chondritic composition for a variety of elements, classic volatility depletion trend, so plotting that against uh, the condensation temperature. And we can see quite clearly the, the relationship between condensation temperature and depletion within, within the Earth relative to the chondrite bodies. But the halogens stand out. Chlorine in particular is much more depleted than you would predict based on that volatility trend. And the question is, uh, is that, why is that, and actually how good is the data that, is, that, 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 we, that we are using to, to uh, make that observation. So how well are these factors constrained for the halogens? How well do we know the bulk silic silicate earth of the composition? I'm not going to talk about that in detail. I'm going to talk principally about the carbonaceous chondrite composition. Uh, and what I want to show you is the current state of affair. I'm going to show you in the next slide um, the actual data that the current database is, is based on, it's, it's, it's a very low number of samples, very low number of analyses of those samples. Most of the values quoted are for two samples, only one for iodine. Estimates for bulk silicate earth vary by a factor of three for chlorine, an order of magnitude for bromine, a factor of six for iodine. We don't know the condensation temperatures for halogens to within about 20 or 30 percent, but 
actually within the other constraints, that's uh, only a small, uh, a small uh, issue. But what you can see, the halogens have got that potential to give us a lot of information, but we're still at a very low base in understanding um, how we can use them. This is the existing data, and I'm, uh, we're looking at the uh, CI chondrites, CMCRs, uh, up to the CVs, and I'm plotting here chlorine, bromine, and iodine at concentration. The shaded range, the shaded range is, the, is the average and the, uh, and the two sigma deviation. You can see samples have been arbitrarily missed out. This is uh, the carbonaceous chondrites, chlorine in particular. There's a series of low concentration analyses which have been ignored. And the, the carbonaceous chondrite reference value used in almost all of the literature um, is uh, the black line shown here. And you can see that there's quite a wide range of data. And the question is, how good is that? The reason the bromine and the iodine is so um, the data set is so poor is we've just not had the capability to measure it. It's, it's, it's in very low concentrations. We've got very small sample amounts. And recently, uh, the neutron irradiation noble gas mass spectrometry technique, this is where you neutron irradiate a sample, convert your halogen into a specific noble gas isotope. It's a technique developed by, it's said to be being pushed forward and pioneered by Ray Burgess in Manchester, one of our co-authors. Uh, but this has allowed us now to really look at the, the, the halogens in much more detail within meteorites. Before I move on to the results, just want to acknowledge, I'm, I won't read them out, but we, we, we do rely on the generosity of a large number of, of institutes and people in providing, in providing our samples. So looking at the carbonaceous chondrites, uh, multiple analyses, we're looking at 0.25 to 3 milligrams of sample in either, either coarse, uh, coarse powders or small chips. Um, you can see that although the precision of the analyses uh, take all guy here. The precision of the analyses is within the samples, but the heterogeneity, even within the samples that, 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 that you, at, at a coarse grain level, is quite is quite huge. This is the for, for, for chlorine, for example. Averaging those, we find quite a surprising result. The iodine and the chlorine ratio is actually remarkably constant for all classes of the carbonaceous chondrites. We've got a very good correlation coefficient with a, a fairly constant iodine to chlorine ratio. Exactly the same for the bromine to chlorine ratio, a fairly constant bromine to chlorine ratio over a huge range of concentrations. We've, we're not seeing the same effect that you see in other trace elements of varying volatility. This is a constant ratio. Clearly, condensation effects and also aqueous alteration is not playing any role in changing the, the elemental ratio of these quite different, you know, these, these species will react very differently to small changes, small loss. Uh, we're not seeing it in the halogen ratios. If we look at the enzytite chondrites, again, a, a good number of samples have, been, have now been analyzed by Trish. And uh, we see the same constant iodine to chlorine to bromine ratio as the carbonaceous chondrites suggesting that certainly the, 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 the accretion under different oxidizing conditions is not having any effect on the halogen elemental abundance ratio. And we're certainly starting to form an, an idea, and this, 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 is, uh, this is similar to uh, the uh, conclusions reached by, by Zach Sharp, that you know, perhaps there's a homogeneous pool in terms of chlorine isotopes, an homogeneous uh, solar nebula pool, but perhaps that extends to the bromine and the iodine as well, from which we're accreting uh, the, the, the carbonaceous and enzytite chondrites without fractionation. We can see now how this plots on the, uh, relative to the bulk silicate earth. How much time do I have? Oh, great. We can see how this uh, plots with respect to the bulk silicate, uh, bulk silicate bulk silicate earth composition. So I'm now plotting iodine chlorine against bromine chlorine. And I'm, we're just using two reference values, bulk silicate earth uh, from uh, Burgess in 2002, most commonly used McDonough and Son, 1995. We've neglected to use uh, a, 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 another common one, Allegra 2001, because he assumes a volatility uh, relationship in determining bulk silicate earth, which is something we're testing, so that wouldn't be self-consistent to, to apply to that. So this is the uh, range of iodine, chlorine, bromine, chlorine in the terrestrial system, two estimates for bulk silicate earth, um, the, the old data set that, uh, that, that I've already shown you. This is the mid-ocean ridge basalt range. It, on a log plot, it looks like it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty extended. 
But what you can see is that trends, trends down to, towards seawater, and this data set has the potential to, be, uh, to have some contamination within it, and that contamination will bring that mid-ocean rich basalt data set down towards the seawater values. So we're, just, we're using the mid-ocean rich basalts as, as, as a, a proxy for our, our, um, our, uh, the, the terrestrial mantle. So our new data plots within that very well. The carbonaceous chondrite, we're looking at this star. The error or the uncertainty in our estimate it encompasses both the top end of the range of the mid-ocean ridge basalt range and certainly the McDonnell and Sun bulk silicate earth estimate and is very close to the uh, Burgess et al. bulk silicate earth estimate. What we are seeing in these samples is the carbonaceous chondrite, this, this pretty constant chlorine, bromine, and iodine ratio, is also preserved in the bulk silicate earth. We're not seeing any fractionation in the terrestrial mantle um, uh, either. So this, this is a, a, a series of elements that you would expect to be fractionated by a variety of processes, preserving the ratio from the carbonaceous chondrites, the different grades of carbonaceous chondrite, through to terrestrial accretion. We can move back to the volatility trend, and what we've also what, what we've, we've also recalculated with these samples is their concentration. The concentrations we're measuring are much lower than previous previous estimates, because we're measuring much lower concentrations. Then the, the difference between the bulk silicate earth uh, decreases. So these are the, the the open symbols are the old estimates. The solid symbols are our revised estimates. Our new results are based on lower carbonaceous chondrite concentrations. And what you can see with the chlorine is that our new results might suggest that you can partially resolve this missing chlorine, um, this missing chlorine issue. But there's a consequence. The bromine and the iodine is also enhanced. And the bromine and the iodine are now well above the predicted volatility trend. So this is not a solution to explaining why we've got missing halogens. What we've got um, is, is, is a, a preservation of the carbonaceous chondrite elemental ratio, not that dissimilar from the PGEs, but preserved within volatile, sensitive process elements, uh, the elements, the halogens, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So to summarize, we've got this strong variation in abundance, but consistent ratios in the carbonaceous and enstite chondrites. Certainly within the carbonaceous processing, aqueous alteration is not affecting that elemental ratio. The oxidation state does not affect that ratio, and the halogens are not across those carbonaceous chondrites fitting the predicted volatility trend. Perhaps we're looking at high reactivity, high temperature removal of the uh, halogens from, the, the, from a common solar nebula re reservoir, something that's, that's been proposed for the, uh, for the, to explain the chlorine isotope systematics. The Earth preserves a chondritic chlorine, bromine, iodine, halogen ratio. That same, re that same ratio is preserved in the, in, in, the, in the Earth today. It certainly does not fit any volatility trend. And because we're not seeing any fractionation, we can rule out processes such as evaporative loss, um, play, playing a role in, 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 in that accretion process as far as the halogens are concerned. We can speculate a little bit, and it's, it's always good to end, 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 end on, a, on a little bit of speculation, about the processes that might be giving us that chondritic composition. Perhaps we are removing the volatiles from the planet and reseeding them. It doesn't work to completely remove the, 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 the halogens and then put a late veneer in, the, ma the mass balance doesn't work for that, particularly with those lower concentrations of the halogens. So uh, while tempting to draw parallels between the PG elements and, and, and late veneers, it's, it's not working for the halogens. But perhaps we are seeing a mechanism of removal of volatiles to the planetary surface and quantitative extraction of those, preserving the chondritic ratio within the final planet, which uh, goes through closure to volatile loss. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for a very quick question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the chlorine isotopes. Uh, what is uh, 
the postulated uh, effect there and uh, uh, how much is known about uh, how they're fractionated and why the chlorine isotopes might be uh, um, fractionated, in what direction? Well, I think the, 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 this, this is the work that, um, that Sharp has produced and with, with co-workers. And I, I, from reading those papers, there is very little fractionation between the different... Um, uh, it, 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 there's very little different fractionation across the chondritic range, uh, and, and that also matches the, the terrestrial and the terrestrial mantle. So no fractionation through the, through the chlorine isotopes, similar to the no fractionation from chlorine to bromine to iodine. One last question. Uh, in the light of the abundance variability, how do you find the absolute concentration in the different chondritic acids? Yeah, very difficult. And I would be very wary of uh, limiting your model to an absolute concentration at this stage um, because we're looking at small samples, point, as I say, 0.25 to 3 milligrams, and measuring big, large amounts of samples, just not practical. <laughs>